Let's take the third kind of recall, psychic recall. Psychic recall is clairvoyantly obtained information. This is recall through the use of an entity or a psychic or a medium or a trance channeler. Randall Bayer is a former New Ager who saved out of the New Age movement and in his book, Inside the New Age Nightmare, he writes about his experience with past life regressions and this is what he says. From personal experience, I can report that such experiences can be quite richly detailed and vividly perceived. You actually can feel like you're in the body of some past incarnation of you, experiencing all the thoughts and sensations of that past incarnation. The environmental last landscape surrounding your past can be incredibly detailed, whether it appears as Renaissance Europe or the Christian Crusades or even sometimes alien planets and extraterrestrial spaceships. The apparent authenticity and depth of the experience can be most convincing and even invigorating. It seems like new vistas of the multidimensional you are there for unending, fascinating exploration and review. I see now, he wrote, that such experiences are sophisticated fabrications perpetrated upon the unwary person by unclean spirits. As the individual leaves himself vulnerable during the trance state, demons have free reign to create all kinds of fairy tales with the person experiencing it, all in dramatic detail. Not only does each past life regression open the person's mind to further levels of New Age brainwashing, but the New Ager often comes out with severe identity problems when it's over. People actually start to believe that they are Cleopatra, Leonardo da Vinci, John the Baptist, all wrapped up in one big multidimensional person. One of the most curious facts about this popular practice is that almost invariably the past lives of those who are regressed into a life beyond where they live, those past lives are always those of royalty, high priests and priestesses, leading historical characters, famous scientists, super advanced alien intelligences, angelic beings in human form, celestial super beings, and all manner of other exalted glorified figures. In other words, they never regress to find that they lived in a past life, a normal, average life like all of us. They always find out that they were somebody famous. And friends, there aren't enough famous people to go around. Now seldom have they ever been involved in their past lives in normal, unremarkable incarnations. You wouldn't believe the hyperinflated spiritual ego trips that come spewing out of the demonic dens marked past life regressions. Come on in and see the untold wonders and mysteries of you, glorious you. Now, we don't have time to go into a lot of detail about this kind of psychotherapy, but let me just remind you that we do need to emphasize one major flaw in all of this, and here is the flaw. Knowledge of past events does not imply your presence in those events. It is possible to have accurate knowledge of past events without having been there personally. Even honest reincarnationists will admit to this. The most likely explanation for this phenomenon is not the transmigration of souls, but the transmigration of demons. Demons can have great information at their disposal and can move into the vacuum created when we open ourselves up through all of these mind uh, techniques that are part of the New Age movement and all of a sudden you've left a vacuum and a demon comes to live within you and he gives you all this information from the past. When we come to the session on channeling, we'll talk about Edgar Cayce, who's a prophet of the reincarnationist movement. And uh, in one of his writings, he actually admitted to this. Listen, these are his words. He said, that's what I always thought. And against this, I put the idea that the devil might be tempting me to do his work by operating through me when I was conceited enough to think God had given me a special power. If ever the devil was to play a trick on me, this would be it. William Peterson gives a very thought-provoking uh, scenario that Casey would have understood. This is what he said. Listen carefully. He said, for a good portion of his life, Edgar Casey was a commercial photographer. He understood very well the mechanics of the trade. A blank film is developed in the dark. The nature of a photograph, whether it is formal family pictures or pornography, depends not on the film, but on the photographer who uses the camera. 
During his trances, Casey's mind was like a blank film that would be developed in the dark. I believe that Casey allowed his camera to get in to the wrong hands. End of quote. Sir John Eccles once said that the brain is a machine that a ghost can operate. So maybe demonic spirits that have data spanning thousands of years are capable of plugging this information into the mind of one being influenced and thus deceiving them concerning reincarnation. Once again, the major principle you need to remember is this. Knowledge of past events does not prove presence in those events. There are other ways of that information being transmitted, and we think we know how it's done. Of course, some of the psychic recall is nothing but out-and-out out fraud. i got to tell you this. Psychology Today had a contest, and they called the contest Scamorama. And they, what they did in this contest, they asked their readers to send in a creative scam. Later, they printed lists of their winners, and this is the one that took the prize. This is the, the scam of all scams. Here it is. Wish you were born rich? Now you can be. If you are one of the growing millions who are convinced of the reality of reincarnation, here's a once-in-a-lifetime offer. First, leave us $10,000 or more in your will. After you pass away, our professional medium will contact your spirit in the other world. Then you tell us when you're coming back and under what name. Upon your return, we regress you at age 21 through hypnosis to this lifetime and ask you for your seven-digit number. Once you give us the number, we give you a check on the spot for your original investment plus interest. The longer you're gone, the more you will receive. <laughs> you may come back to find yourself a billionaire. So show your future self how much you care. Leave a generous welcome back present and we'll take care of the rest. End of quote. And I think that deserves scam of the year, don't you? But it sort of highlights some of the craziness that's involved in reincarnation. Now let's look thirdly at the attempts to support reincarnation from the Bible. From actress Shirley MacLaine to Anglican priest Geddes McGregor, New Age reincarnationists appeal to the Bible for support of reincarnation. While it will not be possible for us to look at all of their favorite verses, I want to examine three of the most often used passages that they say prove Reincarnation. The first one is, and I'll just tell you about this, we won't look this up, but you can write it down in your notes. First argument they use is that Jesus believed in the law of karma because he taught that we reap what we sow. This is in many of their books. I found it probably in ten books this week. It is true that Jesus taught that our present actions have future consequences in our own lives, but he never taught the doctrine of karma. In fact, the most amazing thing about their use of Jesus' words is this. Jesus never said, we reap what we sow. Paul said it in his letter to the Galatians. How in the world can we put our trust in someone who claims access to divine knowledge and they can't even attribute famous quotes to their proper source? Number two, turn your Bibles to John 9. And let me just show you what they do with this passage. John chapter 9, verses 1 to 3. This is the story of Jesus and the blind man. Now watch carefully. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither have this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, the New Agers, the reincarnationists, say that if there was a possibility that this man had sinned before his birth, that he had to have sinned in another lifetime. And Jesus never corrected their question by saying that he hadn't sinned in another lifetime. So obviously Jesus assumed that there was another lifetime in which this man may have sinned. Now, the problem with the assumption is that it fails to take into consideration the mindset of the Jewish people during the time when Jesus was on this earth. The Jews, during Jesus' time on this earth, believed that a child's sin could be explained in three ways. It was either his personal sin, it was either personal sin, or parental sin, or prenatal sin. And they used the passage in the Old Testament to talk about the, uh, the struggle between Jacob and Esau to demonstrate the idea that it was possible for a child to sin while he was in the womb. 
And when they asked Jesus, did this man sin, they were obviously talking about what they understood to be a part of the possibility of sin that Jesus would know about, that they knew about, that maybe this man had sinned while still in the womb. Never in the wildest imagination of Jesus or the disciples was there any thought of reincarnation. It was totally foreign to the mindset of the people in that time. It is absolutely impossible that this verse has anything to do with reincarnation. In fact, Jesus put an end to it all when he said, Neither this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of the Lord might be honored and glorified. So, end argument number two. Thirdly, New Agers love to say that John the Baptist was Elijah reincarnated. And uh, let me just give you the scriptures. We don't have time to look at all of them. This is their strongest argument, and it's right at the center of all of their doctrinal books. The idea is based on the following scriptures. Matthew 11:14. Turn to Matthew 11:14. Matthew 11:14 says this. If you will receive it, this is Elijah which was to come. Speaking of, of course, John the Baptist. Jesus said, if you receive him, this is Elijah. Look at Matthew 17, verses 10 to 13. Matthew 17, verses 10 to 13. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise also shall the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. All right, there's one other passage that we could look at. But let's just stop right there and let me tell you what Shirley MacLaine says about this passage. You're probably surprised she even reads the Bible, but she does. And before she got involved in the New Age movement, she got in atheism and she was searching for meaning in her life and this is what she found. But she reads the Bible because, you see, New Agers believe that all truth is acceptable. They incorporate everything into their religion. Jesus Christ is the cosmic Christ and there's no big deal. You can be a Christian and still be a, a New Ager because it's all part of the one. And we're all going to get there sometime if we keep going around enough. And Shirley MacLaine in her book, It's All in the Playing, says, As I read these verses in Matthew, it is clear to me that Jesus and his disciples were talking about reincarnation. They were saying that John the Baptist had lived in a previous incarnation as Elijah. Now, let me just give you some things to write down. You're going to run into somebody who's going to just give you this, and I just want to tell you this is absolutely impossible for four or five reasons. Reason number one. In order for there to be a reincarnation, the previous person has to die. Elijah never died. Did he? He never died. Read 2 Kings. 2 Kings 2, 9 through 18 tells us Elijah never died. In the first place, he was taken up bodily into heaven. You can't be reincarnated till you die. So we really don't need to say anything more, but let me give you a couple other things. In Matthew 17... We are told that Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to a high mountain where he was transfigured before them. And we are told in this passage that Moses and Elijah appeared before them. By this time, John the Baptist had lived and died. Long after John was supposed to have been the reincarnation of Elijah, Elijah was still around up on the mountain with Jesus. Kind of tough. I don't know any reincarnationist who believes you can be reincarnated and still be who you used to be. Thirdly, in John chapter 1, verse 21, let, just turn over there. This is really interesting. You know, the Bible is so wonderfully clean and right and exact and so keeps us out of trouble. When you're a Bible Christian, you have the best chance of staying out of the ditch. I want you to know that. You read the Bible and it's going to keep you out of a lot of trouble. John chapter 1, verse 21, John is asked by the people who came to visit him if he is Elijah. Notice what it says. And they asked John the Baptist, saying, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Well, maybe he didn't understand that. Maybe he didn't understand that he could have been the prophet Elijah that was prophesied by Malachi 4 5. So what's the next question? Are you that prophet? Who was that? That was the prophet that Malachi said was going to come in the spirit of Elijah. And what did John the Baptist say? I'm not him either. 
I'm not either the original Elijah or the Elijah you're trying to make me. I'm neither one. I'm not Elijah, period. And yet reincarnations keep going on, studying the Bible, saying, Hey, this is John the Baptist, reincarnated Elijah. What Jesus said was this. When Jesus said if they would have accepted it, this was Elijah, he was speaking of John the Baptist's function or his office as a prophet, not his identity as a person. Remember when Elisha asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit back in 2 Kings 2? In verse 15 of that chapter, we are told that the spirit of Elijah was resting on Elisha. And that is the meaning of this statement by Jesus. He was just reminding his hearers that the prophecy concerning John the Baptist at his birth was being fulfilled. That prophecy is recorded in Luke chapter 1 and verse 17. And you know what that prophecy is? Let me read it to you. Speaking of John the Baptist at his birth, And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. That's what Jesus was talking about. John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, but he was not Elijah reincarnated. You know, as Christian people, we ought never to let the enemy take God's holy word and try to use it to support false doctrine. We need to be students enough of the Bible so that we're armed with the truth when they start that craziness on us. Let me finish this up by giving you number four, the alternative to reincarnation in the Christian gospel. And I'd like to do this in some contrasting statements. I know you're taking notes, and I don't have time for us to look at all these passages, but I'm going to give them to you and I'm going to read them. Let the power of the Word of God filter through your heart and mind as we close, will you? The alternative to reincarnation in the Christian gospel. Number one, it is either reincarnation or redemption. It cannot be both. It is either reincarnation or redemption. It cannot be both. If you can find Hebrews chapter 1 very quickly, you might want to find that passage. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3 says this, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Here's the phrase, underline it in your mind. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down. Sins are not dealt with by karmic debt. Sin is dealt with by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the scripture says, by himself, he purged our sins. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin hath left its crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Praise God. Hebrews 9, 11-14 says this, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. God did for us what the reincarnationists are trying to find in living all their lives. What a sad, sad thing that they keep going through the futility and the emptiness of this false doctrine when God has made it available to them if they will just come and trust in Jesus. Hebrews 10:12 says this, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. My friends, it's either redemption or reincarnation. It cannot be both. Number two, it is either reincarnation or resurrection. It cannot be both. Both the Gospels and Acts, the Epistles, feature the doctrine of the resurrection in their writings. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the guarantee that we shall also be resurrected someday. He was not reincarnated for our reincarnation. Acts 10:39 to 40 says, And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. 
1 Corinthians 6.14 And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Amen. Daniel 12.2 And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. It is either reincarnation or redemption. It cannot be both. It is either reincarnation or resurrection. It cannot be both. Thirdly, it is either reincarnation or retribution. It cannot be both. Regardless of what the reincarnationists want to believe about death and judgment, there is one verse that in my estimation, if you don't remember any other verse I share with you, here is the answer to the reincarnationist wrapped up in one verse. Here it is. Hebrews 9:27. Listen to it. And it is appointed unto men once to die. And after that, the judgment. Let God be true and every man a liar. Acts 17, 30 and 31 says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Second Peter 3, 9, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Matthew 25, 41 and 46, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. Let them say what they will, men and women, when judgment day comes. Every single person, reincarnationist or no, will stand before a holy, righteous God to give an account for his life. And it seems to me that if ever we have been motivated to go with the gospel of our Savior, it ought to be now. When our culture is being permeated with this devilish doctrine that's taking people's minds in different directions, helping them to live comfortably in their sin and not face what the Bible really says about life and the future. And I want you to know that they are recoverable from the grasp of Satan. There's a book that was written several years ago called The Death of a Guru. Some of you may have read it. But in this book is the story of Ravi Maharaj. Like his father before him, he was worshipped as a god in India. As a guru, Ravi believed he was divine and that everything was divine. Reincarnation was accepted along with the rest of the Hindu beliefs. And yet, the once followed by many and hailed as a god Ravi came to follow the true God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here is his brief testimony. He said, quote, I know that Jesus wasn't just another one of several million gods. He was, in fact, the God for whom I had hungered. I had met Jesus by faith and discovered that he himself was the Creator. Yet he loved me enough to become a man for my sake and die for my sins. With that realization, tons of darkness seemed to lift, and a brilliant light flooded my soul. Praise the Lord. God can save anyone, no matter who they are or what they have believed, if they will come by faith to receive him.